Welcome back to FRM 120. We're going to keep going with our electrical discussion. Uh, we have talked about power generation and utilization and uh, different things about where that power comes from so that we know what we're working on, how it works, and you know, it's, it just, they're sort of taking the mystery out of it, if you will. At least I hope that's what's happened for you. I um, hope that you've come away at this point with uh, more knowledge on three-phase electricity than you had when you started. I think you probably did. But um, we're going to keep moving, and we're going to get away a little bit uh, away from our power generation and things like that because we've covered that, and I've got just a little bit more to show you. But, I mean, for the most part, we've gone as far in depth as we're going to go as far as power generation, okay? Now, we did talk about this. Is, this is kind of an important thing, though, I do want you to see. Uh, we leave our power generation station, and then we come out of the power plants, usually around 12,000 uh, volts or 12 kilovolts. Okay, uh, usually it's about 13.8, 13.8, and then they step it up in voltage to 400,000 volts as they move it across those long transmission lines. And then as it gets closer to our businesses and our homes, they step it back down. And there is, there is a reason for that that I'm going to talk to you about. First of all, let's talk about a little bit about our, our uh, power formula, okay, for a second, because uh, the, the, uh, the uh, power industry produces power, okay, which is a combination of volts times amps, or if you remember that formula, okay? So power companies step that voltage up for their transmission purpose. Now, why do they do that, okay? But you think about the power formula that we've got here, okay? Power is the, the uh, results of multiplying your amperage and your volts together, and that comes with the power expressed in watts. Now, when it comes out of a power plant, you're talking about megawatts, okay? And a megawatt is one million watts, okay? Sort of sounds like Austin Powers, eh? One million watts, okay? Sorry. Anyway, uh, uh, we are going to move forward, and I want to show you how this formula comes into play, okay? Now, it's, we're not going to do math problems with megawatts. There's no need to do that, okay? Let's just take it real simple, okay? you got something, uh, a load that runs 2,400 watts. Let's say the power plant only puts out 2,400 watts. And again, this is just for mathematical purposes, okay? And, we, and they deliver 120 volts, okay? Well, that's going to pull 20 amps on our circuit. So we're going to need a wire, a cable, a conductor large enough to carry 20 amps. Well, suppose now the 2400 watts that the power plant is producing is going to stay the same. But what if we transmitted that voltage instead of at 120 volts, we transmitted it to 480, four times that much. What happens is our current drops by four times. Okay, so instead of running 20 amps at 120 volts, we're running 5 amps at 480 volts. So, and here's the formula right there, okay? So what we've learned here is that voltage and current, or amperage, is inversely proportional. They are uh, inversely proportional. When our voltage goes up, our current, down, current goes down, and when our voltage goes down, our amperage goes up. This will be especially important when we start talking about transformers, control transformers in our control circuits, okay? But my point is, is that our uh, amperage drops when our voltage goes up. So we step it up to very, very high voltage, and the current drops quite a bit, okay? Um, so the reason they do that is because they can run smaller conductors. Smaller conductors are cheaper for the power companies to run. They're not as big. They're not as, as uh, hard to deal with and get installed and things like that. Plus, there's less surface area for ice to collect on and things like that. So, uh, the, they want to run a smaller wire, and it makes sense. So, they jack that voltage way up high, and there's also less losses at such a high voltage, less line losses, which we're not going to get into in this class. But there are less line losses across the great distances that these conductors have to travel on the tires, as you see, going across the, the, you know, the countryside. And, um, so there are less electrical losses, smaller cable, so there's a win all the way around, so they jack up the voltage. I know that one of the power plants uh, that delivered the power over to an aluminum mill that I worked at, the smelter, uh, 161,000 volts came into our plant. It's very high. We stepped it down at that point, but that 161,000 allowed them to run smaller conductor over to our plant, and we stepped it down from there, and of course when we stepped it down, the current went up, but we had to switch gear and all of the conductors to, to handle such uh, high current levels. But anyway, that's what that's going. That's all we'll talk about. Now, if we generate that power, we're not going to go back into that because you should have a pretty good grip on that, and we apply voltage to our motors to make it run. However, we do not hook 
three conductors straight out of the power plant into our motor. Okay, obviously because you saw where it was running 400,000 volts. We can't do that. We've got to step it down. But when we do step it down, okay, what we have to do is we have to control the motor. Okay, so we step our voltage down to either uh, 480 volts, 208, uh, 240 sometimes of the three-phase voltage. We'll step it down to a little bit lower level. Okay, so we do this with motor controls. All right. Now, not step down part, but we control it with our motor controls, okay? Now, there's five things that our motor controls have to do for us. We want to stop and start the motor, okay? We want to control the speed of the motor. Now, we talked about controlling the speed earlier. We said that we could change the poles in the motor. That's not very practical, not practical at all. So that's really not a very effective way of changing the speed of a motor, but it, the number of poles impacts the speed or the RPM of that motor, okay? We control the speed of that motor. We also use a VFD, a variable frequency drive, which we're going to delve into in a later lesson. Okay? But we want to be able to jog the motor, reverse the motor in case we have to run it backwards. And we also want to protect the motor and the circuit, which is the conductors that are feeding the motor. Right now, we're in this particular lesson, we're going to talk about starting and stopping and also protecting that motor. We'll get to these three here in another lesson. But let's keep going. So, so far, what we've got is we've got three conductors from our power source. Okay? And again, we are, we're, we're not talking about power plants. We've stepped it down going into our business. It's come off that 400,000 volts, stepped it down, and we're dealing with either 480, 240, or 208 voltages, industrial volts. And these are the typical volts that you'll find, voltages you'll find in your breweries as well. But you've got three leads coming in here, and we want to get these three leads connected to that motor, okay? There's some other things that we've got to get into place first, okay? Number one. We have to have a disconnect. This is a means of removing or de-energizing the circuit that runs the motor. We have to de-energize it to make it because we don't want it to run inadvertently. So we, if you remember from our safety lesson, there are lockout tagouts. So this disconnect is a handle that we pull. We snap a lock on it or a hasp with multiple locks on it, and we make sure that we can phys not physically energize that uh, that uh, disconnect while there is a lock on it. It's a safety means that is designed to protect you as you work on the equipment. But this is the symbol, one of three symbols for disconnect, very typical, okay? This, these are the three uh, knives uh, coming into the, uh, for the three phases of the power coming into them. And you'll notice they're not making any connection. They're open. They're in the open state. And if we were to rack it in and close it, then it would have voltage come through and it would power our motors. This is the same thing, another symbol. You'll notice the dash line here. That means there's a mechanical link between these three so that if we pull the handle and it pulls one, all three of them come open at the same time. You don't want to just de-energize one leg of your three-phase because then you'll start single-phasing a motor and that will burn one up. So there's these, this dotted line is a mechanical linkage okay, between these three and you'll probably see that a little bit later on a quiz. Just give me a heads up. Uh, and here's another one. Here's another type of disconnect that's fused, okay? You'll see fuses in the disconnects. Some will have them, some will not, okay? So, but these are the three symbols, okay? And this is where they go in our schematic. Here's our three phases of voltage coming in. Like I said, it could be uh, 480, 240, 208. The three phases of voltage coming in. And this is our disconnect uh, in our circuit. And right now, it's in the open position. There is no path between here and here or here and here, or here and here. So there's no path of continuity for the voltage to flow to our motor. Okay, and that's what the disconnect is designed to do. Here's a picture of a disconnect. This is one very similar to the one in our lab. Okay, you got your, your voltage coming in from our utility uh, company, feeding into the top lugs here. And uh, then you also have a ground conductor. And remember, our ground keeps us safe. In the event that this hot leg right here, L1, one phase of our three phase, uh, gets out of this for some reason and bumps either the ground wire or bumps the metal uh, <clears throat> the metal enclosure that this connects in. It makes immediate contact. It runs that voltage straight to ground and it keeps us safe and protected without this ground uh, in place and intact all the time. We never break this ground, but without this ground in place, this could become energized and we walk up to it and boom, we have become a conductor ourselves because our feet are on the ground we become that ground rod. Not a good thing to happen, okay? It lights you up like popcorn. So, we keep that ground. When we disconnect this, uh, when we disengage the uh, knives here and open, and open them up, like you saw in the, uh, in the uh, symbol, we pull the three conductors that are carrying current uh, open, but we leave the ground 
intact. This does not affect you when we open up our our disconnect knives, okay? But here's where, and then we take our three phases on um, coming out, it comes in, goes through our fuses, and we'll talk about fuses and protection a little bit later, but it will go out of here through the conduit into our motor, okay? So we typically come in the top, we go out the bottom, and we feed our load device, which in this case is a three-phase motor, okay? The, the uh, purpose of this, is, again, I'm just kind of controlled to uh, kind of uh, rehash it, is it isolates the motor from our energy source so we can work on it, okay? Um, it is, uh, isolates our controller and any other motor control circuit components that are in or part of our three-phase system, okay? It protects the workers. Like we said, we would hang a lock right here on the handle so that somebody tries to re-energize that, that, that lock or the hasp that multiple locks are hooked to is going to physically jam that handle and not allow it to become energized while you've got your hands on, on uh, bare conductors or working on motors and things like that, okay? And this is not designed, however, to interrupt the circuit uh, while the motor is running on purpose. Now, if you've got an emergency, absolutely throw that handle, shut it down, but that is not the way you stop and stop a motor. You don't start and stop one with a disconnect. This theoretically, does it work? Yes, it does. But these knives are not designed to uh, withstand the arcing that goes on when you start up a motor, particularly when one is under load, okay? Uh, these are designed to stay, uh, to, to be locked in with no current going through them, and then you switch the devices on, the motor starters on, to start the motor that way. Those devices are designed that way. These are not, okay? So again, it's not to be used to start and stop a motor because the knives cannot withstand the arcing. We've got a little video here. This is a very, very high voltage system out in the switchyard of a, uh, of a uh, utility plant and you can see these conductors are starting to come. Now they are switching it under a load, which you should never do. But they were running some experiments and tests, we've got the video for that, and you'll see that the arcing starts to play, come into play before they actually make contact, okay? And while that arcing, that little lightning bolt there you saw, that arcing is uh, eroding and chewing away the material that's supposed to be a good bond and connection. And that's what you want in these knives uh, of, these, of the disconnect too. Okay, now what we want to do now is talk about some protection devices that we've got in here, okay? Now we want to talk about phase to phase and phase to ground prote protection, okay? And going back to my schematic here, just very quickly, phase to phase is when two phases come in contact, they short together, okay? They should never come in contact. Whether in here, they should never rub together, and sometimes the insulation will rub due to vibration and they'll come in contact with one another. That's a phase-to-phase -phase, uh, short circuit or phase-to-phase -phase condition, okay? And we don't want that to happen, okay? Because the high the current goes very, very high and we start uh, blowing fuses and it could, it's, it's, it's just a real hazard, okay? Also, we, um, the other type of um, <clears throat> protection we're trying to protect against is the phase-to-ground. And we talked about that. If one of our phases accidentally comes in touch with the ground wire or with this cabinet here being grounded, if it touches any part of this metal cabinet, we have a phase to ground uh, situation. So that's what we're, the fuses are designed to protect. Now, a lot of people say it's designed to protect an, from an overload. We're going to talk specifically about what an overload is. Okay, it is not uh, a short circuit. Okay, so those two are very different. So keep that in your head as we keep going through. So the types of uh, protection devices that we will we will be de dealing with. Is the fuse. This is a symbol. Sometimes you'll have an F over the top of it, just fuse. And a lot of times you'll have a number in there saying what that fuse is rated at 15 amps, 10 amps, 20 amps, whatever the circuit is designed to be running with as far as current flow. We want that fuse to protect our uh, circuit. Okay? The fuse does not protect the motor. Okay? I want to say that again. The fuse is not designed to protect the motor. The fuse is designed to protect the conductors going to the motor. Okay, so in other words, uh, we have a device separate for this that will protect the motor. Okay, this protects us and it protects the conductors uh, in our circuit. Okay, now one thing that people tend to do, and we're going to keep moving with fuses, but uh, one thing that people tend to do is if they blow a fuse and it blows a f another fuse, the next thing they'll do is say it's a 15 amp fuse. Well, then they go and grab a 20 amp fuse. Okay, well, what you've done is you've made this fuse rated higher than what your conductors are designed to run at. Okay, and I'm using hypothetical numbers at this point. 
but if you put a 20 amp fuse in a circuit that's designed to run for 15 amps, on, on 15 amps, excuse me, you have no longer, this is supposed to be your weak link. This is supposed to be your uh, sacrificial lamb, if you will, your sacrificial material. You have moved that, and now your wires are your sacrificial material. Okay, so what's going to happen? They're going to get hot. They're going to burn up. Uh, you know, and uh, and it's just going to it's going to ruin a lot of equipment downstream. But mostly, it's going to be a fire hazard. Okay, so your fuses are designed to protect the circuit, and also uh, which is which is made up of the conductors and us as individuals. Okay, uh, the typical fuses that all come all different shapes and sizes, blades and just regular type cartridge fuses. Some of them even have blown indicators. So that when a fuse blows, you don't have to have a meter. You can see this little window right here will become smoked and cloudy from burning the element up inside. So that gives you an idea too. And there's also some of them have even LEDs on them now. So if they blow a fuse, the, the voltage passes through the LED and you can see which one is lit up and that's your bad fuse. Okay, fuses are not resettable. They have to be replaced. Okay, they're kind of a one and done thing. They are less expensive than circuit breakers, which we'll be talking about next. But uh, they are less uh, expensive, and some have, like I said, some of them have visual blown um, indicators. Uh, the non-time delayed fuses typically hold five times their amp rating for about a quarter of a second. So when you get that surge of voltage when something comes on, I know the lights get dim sometimes when the boilers come on, or even in your homes when the HVAC comes on, it gets dim for you. That's an inrush of current that these fuses will have to ride through, okay, and they have about a quarter of a second ride through time. Uh, if, it, if it's much longer than that, a, a very high current, much longer than that, then they're going to blow, okay? But anyway, the other type of phase to phase and phase to ground protection is the circuit breaker. Okay, a lot of you are familiar with that. You got them in your homes, okay? You got single phase, two pole, and three pole, uh, three pole uh, for the three phase uh, circuit breakers. They've got advantages in that they are resettable. You don't have to replace them, you just go out there and reset them, okay? And uh, once I would moved into a place that had um, uh, the, the circuit breakers turned off, and we uh, came in there, started them up, and you know fired them up. Guy helping me uh, noticed that you know, the one kept tripping on the refrigerator, and I was out unloading some stuff and kept tripping and kept tripping and kept tripping. And next thing you know, uh, that that surging of voltage, we found a short. That circuit breaker was trying to tell us, hey, we've got a short circuit, a phase to ground circuit and it started a fire in the attic. So uh, that's why you don't reset, reset, reset. Same as you don't keep replacing the fuses, particularly with higher rated fuses. So that was a real world example that, that helped me. Uh, and these are more expensive than fuses, uh, but you can also, like some of the fuses, you can visually see when an overcurrent uh, condition has uh, happened. Now, this is an overcurrent condition, a phase to phase, a phase to ground. These are overcurrent conditions and not overload conditions. Like I said, I'll talk about that shortly. Here are some symbols that you've seen before or in the earlier slide. There's a single pole, double pole, and a three pole that would be for our three phase voltage. Okay? And you'll see those in the drawings. Now, what I've done is I've taken a big drawing and took a snapshot. It's not a real good snapshot. And I apologize for that. But you see these three dots right here. These are connection points. So we got our th main feeder line coming in, our main voltage. And we pull a leg off of here, and a leg off of here, and a leg off of here, and that's three phase voltage we're going to feed to a motor or some other device. It could be heating elements or whatever. But I just want to show you the circuit breaker and how you'll see them in a schematic because print reading and diagram uh, reading schematics is all part of this class as well. So here's, I'm kind of baby uh, feeding you, uh, spoon feeding you a little bit as we go. Now, we're going to talk about overload protection. This is completely different from overcurrent. Don't get the two mixed up, okay? Overload uh, protection. An overload, first of all, is when the motor is required to pull more current or amperage than it is designed to run when it's fully loaded, okay? So uh, uh, the, the fully loaded uh, amperage or full load current, FLA, FLC, interchangeable, mostly, I've, I've seen mostly FLA. Uh, the full load amperage rating of a motor is the maximum uh, current that it's designed to run at full time, okay? You know, 100% of the time. 
Now, if it's rated, let's, I'm just going to use round numbers. If it's rated to run at, at 20 amps, okay? It can run all day long, all you know, 24/7 at 20 amps, and nothing will happen to it. Okay, it'll be just fine. However, if we overload, like in this position, this uh, excuse me, this uh, picture here, we have a conveyor, and we put more than the conveyor uh, is supposed to handle. It puts the load on the motor. Whereas this 20 amp motor is supposed to run at 20 amps all day long for us, okay? If we start bumping it up to 22, 23 amps, uh, it will run. It'll continue to run, okay? Uh, but it will. It, it's starting to eat into the life of the motor, okay? Your windings are getting too hot. Uh, there's the insulation on the windings, uh, you know, those windings are the pieces of wire wrapped around that steel cores in that motor, okay? Those windings get hot and the insulation starts to break down over time. So the more you run it beyond its FLA capacity, the uh, quicker you are sending it to the graveyard, okay? So it starts to cut down on its life expectancy. So you really work one really hard with bad bearings or bad, you know, overloading this one here. We've got delicious brown ale aging in a, in a, a bourbon barrel. If we've got too many of these uh, barrels with this delicious brown ale aging in the uh, bourbon barrels. Then we wind up overloading the, the uh, motor that's running this conveyor, okay? So we don't want to exceed FLA for very long at all, okay? Um, in a brewery where we might see an overload, okay, not a short circuit or not an overcurrent, but an overload, is the overfilling a grist mill, okay? Uh, when, in, in our mill, when we're trying to grind our, our grain, if we overfill that and it chokes it up, okay, that could cause an overload condition, all right? Um, jam parts in the grain auger that transfers after the grain has been milled over to a uh, to a uh, mash tun because we get ready to, back to mash in. Uh, if there's jam parts, if there's bad bearings um, or anything's in a, in, in a bind or something like that, um, that will cause a motor to run in an overloaded condition as well. If you were to leave something in the mash tun and someone were to turn on the rake and plow, uh, this thing has a very expensive gearbox mounted on top of it. The ones that I've seen in most breweries are Eurodrives, uh, SEW Eurodrive brand. Uh, very expensive. They're excellent gearboxes, by the way, gear reduction boxes. But they are uh, designed to uh, to move this very slowly with a lot of torque. You jam something there, you're going to ruin a uh, gearbox uh, because of an overload position, uh, condition. Hopefully, the overloads will take the, the, the circuit out before it jams it up. But Anyway, that's the typical places that you might see an overload condition in a brewery, okay? All right, and this is the symbol for an overload, okay? And remember, an overload is not overcurrent, okay? That's not where two conductors get together. This is a, uh, conduct, this is a uh, uh, thermal overload that monitors the heat. Now, the more load we put on a motor, okay, the more heat the windings uh, create, and those windings, uh, let's see if I've got the next next one here. Okay, the windings will transfer that heat into these thermal overloads and these thermal overloads will separate. And when they separate, it kills the power going to the three-phase motor so it can rest and cool off. And if it's got an overload condition, uh, a lot of times people will reset it and keep on, let it keep on trucking. One reset's not so bad, it could be a glitch. If you have to keep resetting something, if that machine is telling you something and you need to pay attention, it's trying to tell you that something's jammed it up you've got some worn parts uh, or something's going on that's causing it to overload. Now, occasionally these will get weak and they'll trip out prematurely, uh, you know, before the, the rated uh, design, but the idea is that the windings heat up, the heat transfers through the conductors, and then these start to open up uh, as a result and from the current flow, the excessive current flow, and it opens them up and shuts the three phases down. This is a typical motor starter here, and our overloads are, mo are down here. We're going to get into these later, but you usually have, you typically have three phases of voltage coming into these conductors here. We have a way of controlling this and closing the gap so that we can get our motor, three phase to our motor. But this monitors the current flow, and if any one of the three phases uh, heats these up to the point where they need to snap out, where they need to come apart, pulls all three of them out at the same time. But this is an overload block on a motor starter. The motor starter part we're going to, we're going to get into the next lesson, okay? So here we go. We've got our three legs of power. We've got our disconnect. We have our fuses. The disconnect is going to isolate the power and protect us, okay? The um, fuses 
are going to protect us for overcurrent, which is uh, phase to phase or phase to ground. Okay, and then here are the overloads that are going to protect us or protect the motor and the equipment uh, from uh, destroying itself uh, because it'll open up after too much current. Boom and then suddenly you've got a gap between your power source and the motor and it stops running, all right? And again, um, uh, these, three, these three overloads, we want to you know, watch them very closely and make sure that we don't keep resetting them, okay? But uh, this, is your, this is basically what we've talked about so far, okay? Now, there's a couple of different types of motor controllers and uh, that's the next the part we're going to talk about is the actual controllers themselves, all right? The first one we're going to talk about is the manual motor starter. And we also talked about, we're going to talk about the magnetic motor starter, and we've also talked about the VFD. But what we're going to focus on for right now is the manual motor starter, okay? Here's a couple of samples here. This is a magnetic one. This is a manual one. I really like this manual one right here. Uh, and this is a very, very simple way to start and stop a motor, okay? This is the device, not the disconnect, but this is the device that we're going to use to start and stop our motor, okay? And this uh, motor starter here has a, three sets of contacts in here. These are the symbols for contacts, okay? Now, I've got one here that's uh, off of a trainer, uh, one of my motor control classes, okay? And this, not this panel part. This is just part of the trainer. But this is an actual Allen Bradley manual motor starter, okay? And the way it operates, you've got three, volt, three power leads coming in from our three phase. And then we have three leads going out to our motor, okay? Disregard this completely. It's part of the, like I said, part of the training panel. But it's very easy to operate. It's a simple operation. On and off. You know, just that simple. Good solid click. On and off. And right here is the overload device in the that's built into this manual motor starter. So if I turn it on and I've got something like a bad bearing or I've got something jammed up on a conveyor or I've, or I've jammed up something in my... Um, in my uh, 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 mash tun with the rake and plow, that's going to monitor the windings. And if it sees a buildup of heat, it's going to snap this open and kind of be, the buttons will be kind of halfway in between. Okay, uh, but uh, that's the way this works. It's very simple. Just use your hand to operate it. No control voltages or anything like that needed. Very simple. Okay, but that snapping that you're hearing is the three sets of contacts for L1, L2, and L3, our three phases of power, closing so that we can um, uh, so we can close the voltage, the gap here, and our voltage travels through our overloads to monitoring into our motor to make it run. These are what are called normally open contacts. Now, we call them normally open contacts because just sitting on the shelf with nothing going to them, they are in their open position. Their natural state is in an open position. We have to actuate or activate that motor starter like I did with my finger earlier. We have to actuate that in order to get these normally closed, uh, normally open uh, contacts to close, but they were, they're always referred to uh, in this state as normally open. Okay? Um, the manual motor starter that I showed you there, and this one in this, in this picture here, is the most basic form of motor control. Like I showed you, you got three wires in, three wires out, and a push button, you're ready to go. Now, one thing about it is every motor, uh, well, you know, every the motors come in different horsepower ratings, okay? So you have to match, you have to make sure that the motor starter matches the horsepower. So if you have to replace one of these anywhere in your brewery or wherever you're working, uh, you have to make sure that it matches because these things have the overloads, and the overloads have to match the load that it's protecting, okay? So in other words, if I have a 20 horsepower motor, and I've got, uh, a, I've got a, a motor starter with overloads that are designed to protect up to, to a 30 horsepower, it's, gonna, it's not going to see a 20 horsepower as an as a, um, overload condition as a real problem. It's going to let it ride on through. Well, it's going to sacrifice the motor. It's out there just screaming for help. When this is over here waiting on a 30 amp, uh, issue to arise before it does anything. On the flip side of that, if it's too small, as soon as you start it and the, and the first little bit of a load that comes on it, okay, it's going to trip it out prematurely. So they have to be matched, okay? And um, the, uh, typically these are good for up to 10 horsepower on a three phase system. And like I said earlier, it has overloads for motor protection, okay? Not wire protection, not for us, but for our motor, okay? 
and they're typically inexpensive. There's not a lot of uh, control wiring. That, there's no control wiring at all that has to go with these. The control is your finger pushing this button, the start button, the stop button, okay? And it's just, like I said, three uh, conductors go in, and our three uh, conductors go out to our motor. It's just that simple, okay? And um, the operator controls the starting and the stopping by pushing these buttons, okay? So when we push our buttons, we close these normally open contacts. They're now closed. We don't call them normally closed. They're, they're just normally open contacts that are now closed. And now we have current flow going to our motor through our overloads that are monitoring the uh, current flow to our motor, okay? Um, there is no voltage required to operate these, just the incoming voltage for the motor, you know, to, to make this work. There's no special engineering uh, or anything like that. The contacts, like I showed you earlier, the contacts are going to stay closed. Once I press that, they're, um, they're going to stay closed until I come back and open. Now, if I lost power, however, they would stay closed. Well, that's kind of a good thing and kind of a bad thing, depending on the application. If it's in the start position and all of a sudden, let's say a car hits a power line outside, a power pole outside of our uh, business, we lose power, they come back, they restore power an hour later, this button is still pressed in. As soon as that voltage hits this, it's going to travel on straight over our motor and that motor is going to take off and running. In some cases, that might be good. If you run an exhaust fan, there's no real big issue there. But if you've got somebody poking around trying to figure out, why is this not running? Why is this not running? You know, and it starts up, it can be a dangerous situation. So it's kind of the good and the bad. But these are manual motor starters, and like I said, they have to be uh, sized properly to the motor that they are trying to control, okay? Um, they are typically mounted with inside of the motor, just one more uh, tidbit there. Um, and like I said, this is just uh, the, the normally open contacts that are inside, and so what we've learned so far, we know some symbols on our disconnect, our fuses, our normally open contacts, our overloads, and our conductors, and what each one of these does. So, we've learned a lot, okay? That being said, uh, that's going to be the end of this uh, lesson, um, and uh, we're going to have some labs coming up soon. Uh, if you need anything, reach out and get a hold of me. I hope you've learned something. Uh, email me, text me, let me know, hey, I don't understand something, would you mind covering this again? We'll do some more, okay? For right now, uh, just take care of uh, your uh, textbook reading and any articles that I might have posted up there, and uh, we will talk to you in the next lesson. Thank you.